to continue our good evening. We already do continue our trek through the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, we're now at lesson 7 out of 10, and we pick up the specific stipulations of this Susan Vassal Treaty called the book of Deuteronomy with chapter 18, verse 15. We begin with the law of the prophet. We begin by uh, discerning a true prophet from a false prophet. Let's start at verse 15 with the call of the prophet. The Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from Israel, from the midst of thee, of your brethren, so will be a Jewish man, like unto me, like Moses. Now, in Numbers 12, 6 through 8, we learn that other prophets were not like Moses. With others, God communicated through visions and dreams. But with Moses, God speaks face to face. Ultimately, this is going to speak of the Messiah. And so Israel's obligation in regard to this prophet, unto whom, unto him, ye shall hearken. Now, the historical background of this, uh, this section starts in verse 16 with Israel's request. According to all that you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb, in the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And so God's answer to that request is verse 17, And the Lord said unto me, They have well said that which they have spoken. And so the divine prophet is the response in verse 18, I will raise up to them a prophet, from among their brethren, like unto you, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I shall, shall command him. And an obligation comes with this uh, blessing, verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which, I will speak, which he will speak in my name, I will require it of him. Uh, just a quick comment from the Expositor's Bible Commentary that I thought was worth sharing with you on page 22 of volume 3. We read, The prophet like you from among their brothers was seen as a messianic prediction, a prophet par excellence. This interpretation was widespread in New Testament times, being mentioned in the New Testament and among the Essenes, as well as among the Jews, the Gnostics, and others. And then on page, uh, excuse me, I didn't advance that, I'm sorry. On page 123 we read, Was not Jesus himself calling this Deuteronomic passage to mind when he said of Moses, He wrote about me. And of course he was. Now this uh, prophet like unto Moses is mentioned six times in the Greek of the Shah, the New Testament. Let me just share three examples with you. The first one is, First John, uh, John 1 John 1.21, and we see here that the prophet was expected by the priests and Levites from Jerusalem. And John the Baptist, his, um, his testimony in John 1.21, and they asked him, what then? Art thou Elijah? And he said, no, I am not. Art thou the prophet? There it is. And he answered, no. Now it was um, Peter who preached to the masses at the beautiful gate, and they were expecting the prophet, Acts 3, 20 through 23. He says, And that he may send the Messiah, whom hath been appointed for you, even Yeshua. Yeshua is the Messiah, very clearly there. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, whereof God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, that have been from of old. Moses indeed said, Here's our quote. A prophet shall the Lord God raise up unto you from among your brethren, like unto me. To him shall ye hearken in all things whatsoever he shall speak unto you. And it shall be that every soul that shall not hearken to that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among his people. So Peter knew the book of Deuteronomy, didn't he? And also Stephen, he knew the book of Deuteronomy, Acts 7.37. In his testimony, he says, This is that Moses who said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall God raise up unto you from among your brethren like unto me. So these guys knew Deuteronomy. Now, in contrast to the true prophet, in verse 20 is the false prophet. 
And two cases are brought forward here. In verse 20, but that prophet, in the first case, that shall speak a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. So this, this refers to the prophet who claimed to speak in the name of the God of Israel, but there was no divine revelation. See, a prophet receives and shares direct revelation. In this case, there is none. Going on in verse 20, the second case, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, not in the name of the Lord. And there's a punishment. That same prophet shall die. So the unauthorized prophet receives the death penalty. This is serious stuff. And then the question would arise, well, how are we going to know the truth? And that's in verse 21. And if you shall say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? So how are we going to tell the truth from the false? And the answer comes in verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, you see, whatever God speaks comes to pass. So if it does not come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. And the prophet has spoken presumptuously. God's prophecies come to pass 100%. So this prophet has spoken in pride and insolence. And the result, you shall not be afraid of him, no matter how powerful he appears to be. Don't be afraid to reject him. No matter what threats he may uh, issue, don't be afraid to put him to death. So there's two marks of a false prophet. First of all, he teaches contrary to scripture. That's the primary mark. But second, his predictions do not come to pass. That's the secondary mark. Now in Israel, God's prophet was, uh, it was God's prophet and not the king who was the highest authority in the land because Israel's government was a theocracy. So the prophet spoke directly from God. As we move into chapter 19, verse one, the law of the cities of refuge comes into sight. First of all, the timing. When the Lord your God shall cut off the nations whose land the Lord your God gives you, and you shall succeed them and dwell in their cities and in their houses. So the timing is after the conquest of the land. Then these cities will be appointed in verse 2. You shall set apart three cities for you in the midst of the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess it. And we saw earlier that three cities of refuge had been set up on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, Golan for Manasseh, Ramoth Gilead for Gad, and Beza for Reuben. But now we're talking about the west side of the Jordan, and eventually uh, Kadesh will be set aside for Naphtali, Shechem for Ephraim, and Hebron for Judah. Eventually there will be six cities of refuge. Verse 3, you shall prepare the way. They are to survey the land and provide good access roads to these cities. And divide the borders of your land, which the Lord your God causes you to inherit into three parts, so that these three cities are centrally located in each section. The purpose that every manslayer may flee thither. Now, what are the qualifications for somebody who can flee to one of these cities? Now, the issue is what we call manslaughter in verse 4. And this is the case of the manslayer that shall flee thither and live, who so killed his neighbor unaware. So this is an accidental death, and hated him not in the past. So it's not premeditated murder. And so we have an example in verse 5. As when a man goes into the forest with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetches a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the axe slips from the helm. In other words, the axe head slips off the axe handle and lights upon his neighbor so that he dies. Verse 5. He shall flee into one of these cities and live. Now why? Verse 6. Lest the avenger of the blood pursue the manslayer. Now the term blood here is being used as a euphemism for a violent death. Lest the avenger of this violent death pursue the manslayer while his heart is hot. He's acting on the basis of emotions, not on the facts. And he overtake him because the way is long and, and smite him mortally. Whereas he was not worthy of death, in, in so much as that he hated him not in the past. This is accidental manslaughter, not homicide. 
So in verse 7, we come to the appointment of the cities. Therefore, because of the above type of circumstance, because of the example, I command you, you set apart three cities for you. And then the law of additional cities of refuge comes forward in verse 8. And if the Lord your God enlarge your border, as he had sworn unto your fathers, to give you all the land which he promised to give to your fathers, so full possession of the land is in view here. And all this has not happened in his, Israel's history so far, but full possession of the land will occur during the kingdom. Verse 9, if you shall keep all this commandment and do it, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to walk ever in his ways, then you shall add three cities more for you besides these three. And again, this does not happen. This awaits the kingdom. And in verse 10, the reason that innocent blood not be shed in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance, so blood would be upon you. So blood here means the responsibility, the guilt, because the manslayer did not deserve uh, the violent death. And the principle here is that bloodshed, violence, pollutes the land. Now there are others that are disqualified from entering a city of refuge, verse 11. But if a man hates his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally so that he dies, this is premeditated murder, and he flees to one of these cities, verse 12, then the elders of his city, the murderer's city, shall send to the city of refuge and fetch him thence, bring the murderer back to his own city, his own home, and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood. That's the kinsman who will execute justice. And the purpose that he may die. He uh, deserves the death penalty. And in verse 13 comes out an important principle. Your eye shall not pity him. So don't practice false pity. This is misplaced sympathy. But you shall put away the innocent blood from Israel. So by executing the one guilty of murder, because he shed innocent blood. And why? That it might go well with you. The community's welfare is assured if justice is practiced. In verse 14, we come to the law of the landmark. Now, people's lives were important, we saw just a moment ago, but also people's lands, personal property. Verse 14, you shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in your inheritance, which you shall inherit, and the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess. So moving the landmark is the, is the, is, is it would result in stealing the property, property. And this is a violation of the Eighth Commandment. And apparently this became a widespread problem in Israel. It's also a violation of the Tenth Commandment against coveting. Then we come to the law of the witness in verse 15. First of all, the, the number required. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or any sin in any sin that he sinned. A matter shall be established by the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses. So there must be adequate, clear evidence prevented, pre presented in court. So you establish a matter with two or three witnesses. Verse 16. If an unrighteous witness rise up against my, against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, now this is, a, this is especially true if only one witness is involved, well then the high court is brought into the case, verse 17. Then both men, between whom the controversy is, so remember there's only two men involved here, one witness per side, Per side, yes, they shall stand before the Lord, who is the divine judge, before the priests and judges that shall be in those days. These are God's representative, the higher court. Now the rabbis note that it only says men here, and so they came to the conclusion that women cannot testify. So under Jewish law, women cannot serve <coughs> as witnesses in a court of law. That's where they get that ruling, verse 17. In verse 18, we get a glimpse at the trial. 
and the judges shall make diligent inquisition to try to find out the truth here. And behold, if the witness is a false witness and have testified against his brother, verse 19, then ye shall do unto him as he had thought to do unto his brother. You reap what you sow. The punishment needs to fit the crime. So shall you put away the evil from the midst of you. And this is a violation of the ninth commandment against false witness. Here we see the principle of lex talionis, the law of retaliation. Verse 20. And those that remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more such evil in the midst of you. So again, swift justice is effective. And now we come in verse 21 to that principle. Punishment in kind. And your eyes shall not pity. Again, don't be swayed by inappropriate sympathy. Life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Mm -hmm. The point is that the punishment shall fit the crime, not more, not less. Now we get to chapter 20 and verse 1, and we come to the law of warfare. The circumstance is in verse 1. When you go forth to battle against your enemies and see horses, chariots, a people more than you, so you're facing in a, a better equipped and larger army, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So in the case here, as you go to war, the priest begins by making a declaration in verse 2. And it shall be, when you draw nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and, and speak to the people. In verse 3 is his declaration. And he shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye draw nigh, ye draw near this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint, fear not, nor tremble, neither you be afraid, affrighted of them. Verse 4, the reason. For the Lord your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. So the priest encourages the people to begin with. And then the officers come forward with a declaration, starting in verse 5. The first declaration. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, and three cases are presented. The first case deals with a new house. What man is there that has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Now, the word dedicated implies a religious ceremony. The dedication of house was a sacred ceremony to God. So if someone has not dedicated his house, let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Case number two deals with property, the vineyard, in verse 6. And what man is there that had planted a vineyard and had not used the fruit thereof? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man use the fruit thereof. The third case is that, that of uh, deals with the family, the, the case of a new bride. Verse 7. And what man is there that had betrothed the wife and had not taken her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. Now, this seems kind of, kind of odd when you're facing a battle, but since God was fighting for Israel, it was not necessary for a war to take priority over domestic concerns. That's the, not the way normal armies work, but Israel's would work that way. In verse 8, we get a second de declaration, and this is for the purpose of morale. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? The instruction, let him go and return to his house, lest his brother's heart melt as his heart. In other words, in case he influences others to be afraid as well. This is a purpose for military morale. Then in verse, in verse 9, we have the appointment of the officers. And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, they shall appoint captains of the hosts at the head of the people. Now as we get to verse 10, the policies of war are discussed. 
First of all, a policy for war outside the land. This is external war in verse 10. An offer of peace begins the, uh, begins the battle. And when you draw nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. What happens if they accept your offer? And it shall be if it make you an answer of peace and open unto you, then it shall be that all the people are, that are found therein shall become tributary to you and shall serve you. So they'll become vassals of Israel. They'll be subjugated as laborers. But what if they are not in agreement with this peace offer? If it will make no peace with you, but will make war against thee, you shall besiege it. Verse 13, when the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, first you shall smite every man with the edge of the sword, and in verse 14, you'll gather the spoils of war. But the women and the little ones and the cattle, all that is in the city, even all the spoils thereof, you shall take for a prey unto yourself. And you shall eat the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. So that's, <clears throat> that's external war. Now we come to the policy for war inside the land, internal war. Verse 15, we have a distinction, a contrast. Outside the land, thus you shall do unto the cities which are far off, very far off from you, which are not the cities of these nations. Now the third term, these nations, refers to the cities within the promised land. For them, the policy is extermination, verse 16. But of the cities of these people that the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes. Verse 17, but you shall utterly destroy them. And then they're listed. The Hittite in the north, the Amorite in the south, the Canaanite along the coast, the Perizzite in the hill country, the Hivite in Golan and Lebanon, and the Jebusite in the area of Jerusalem. As the Lord your God has commanded you. And the reason is in verse 18, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, so you would sin against the Lord your God. So the evil influence of these idol-worshiping nations has to be totally removed. And during this war, there's a policy concerning trees that Israel is to follow, verse 19. First of all, dealing with fruit trees, and when you shall besiege a city a long time in making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy the trees thereof by wielding an axe against them. Verse 19 continues, For you may eat of them. You shall not cut them down. The reason? For is the tree of the field a man, that it should be besieged of you? You know, a tree can't defend itself. And a tree has a useful purpose for man. You know, the fruit trees are not the enemies of Israel. So leave them alone. But in verse 20, what about the non-fruit tree? Only the trees which you know that they are not trees for food, you shall destroy and cut them down. And you shall build bulwarks against the city that makes war with you until it fall. And now we move into... Um, chapter 21, verse 1, and here we take up some social and family laws. The first social law is the law of the unknown murderer in chapter 21, starting in verse 1. If one be found slain in the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess it, lying in the field, and it not be known who had smitten him, so this is the case of an unsolved murder, verse 2. Then, then your elders and your judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about them that is him that is slain. So the purpose is to discover the nearest city. The closest city to the body will make expiation for this unknown murder. And so the expiation sacrifice is described in verse 3. And it shall be that the city which is nearest unto the slain man, even the elders of that city, shall take a heifer from the herd. Now a heifer is a young female cow less than three years old. 
which has not been wrought with, it's not been put to work in general, which has not drawn the yoke, it's not been used to plow in particular, and the meaning here, it's not been defiled by man. And then in verse 4, the elders of that city shall bring the heifer into the valley, which is neither pl uh, plowed nor sown. So this is not a defiled valley e either. We have a pristine animal and a pristine valley. And shall break the heifer's neck in that valley. Now breaking the neck showed that the crime deserved capital punishment. But it's not killed by shedding blood. Normally the juggler vein was cut. It is not a regular sin or trespass offering which required the shedding of blood by a priest. Now a blood sacrifice could only be offered in the central valley, in the central sanctuary, not in this particular valley, whatever where it would be. Verse 5 comes to the role of the priests. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. From them the Lord your God has chosen to minister unto him, to bless the name of the Lord, according to their word, shall every controversy and every stroke be. So they're there as observers, they're directors of the action, to guide the elders of the city. In verse 6 we come to the washing of hands. And all the elders of the city who are nearest unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. So the reason for this is that this would be a sign of the innocence of the community regarding the homicide. And of course this is how Pilate attempted to proclaim his innocence in regard to the crucifixion of Yeshua. In Matthew 27, 24, Pilate was performing an act the onlookers would understand. Verse 7. And they shall answer and say, basically they're going to say we're innocent, they shall say, our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. We're not responsible for this death. Verse 8, forgive, O Lord, your people Israel, whom you have redeemed. Suffer not innocent blood to remain in the midst of your people Israel. And again, this innocent blood, blood is speaking of a violent death there. And the results, the violent death, the blood shall be forgiven them. Verse 9. So shall you put away the innocent blood from the midst of you, which you shall do, and when you shall do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. So following through on this ceremony causes the violent death, uh, means that the violent death will not be attributed to them. And we will not be responsible for it. Then as we move to chapter 21, verse 10, we come to the law of marriage with a female prisoner of war. So we begin in verse 10 with a description of the war. When you go forth to battle against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands, and you carry them away. So according to chapter 20, verses 16 through 18, this would be a non-Canaanite city. This would be outside the land. So this is permitted only with non-Canaanite women. Verse 11. And you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you have a desire unto her, and would have, and would take her as to you as wife. And then uh, in verses 12 and 13, there's some psychological preparation for both parties. Verse 12. <coughs> then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails, trim her nails. Verse 13. She shall put the raiment of her captivity off her, from off her. And she will, shall remain in your house and bewail her father and mother for a full month. That's the typical mourning period. And after that, you shall go on to her to be your husband, and she shall be your wife. Now, what's the case if this marriage doesn't work out? <laughs> Verse 14. If you have no delight in her, then you shall let her go whithsoever she will. But you shall not sell her for money. You shall not deal with her as a slave. Why? Because you have humbled her. He's humbled her through sexual union. 
And establishing a sexual relation imposes ob obligations upon that man, marital obligations. He needs to treat her with respect. Then in verse 15, we come to the law of sonship. We first look at the firstborn son in verse 15. If a man have two wives, the one beloved, that means the one chosen, this is the object of his primary affection, the other hated. Now this doesn't mean he has this emotional displeasure in her. She is simply not chosen. She is the object of his secondary affection. The one beloved, the other hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. Remember, again, it's not necessary to emotional displeasure here. And if the firstborn son of hers that was hated, verse 16, then it shall be, the day he causes his sons to inherit that which he has, he may not make the son of the beloved the firstborn, before the son of the hated, who is the firstborn. Verse 17, but he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the hated, by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So the right of the firstborn is a double portion of the inheritance. So the son is not the, the son who is not the firstborn cannot be, cannot be, uh, cut in the line ahead of the actual firstborn simply because of a father's declaration. The inheritance priority cannot be changed at the whim of the father. The firstborn retains his rights no matter what the father thinks of the mother. Now in verse 18, we come to the circumstance of a rebellious son. Verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, who will not obey the voice of his mother or the voice, excuse me, the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, though they chasten him, thus this disobedience is perpetual, it's habitual, it's ongoing. This is not an occasional lapse of disrespect or whatever. This is incorrigible wickedness. And he will not hearken to them. He flaunts their authority, he rejects their authority. Then the role of the parents in verse 19. Then shall his father and his mother, so the proceedings are initiated by the parents, shall lay hold of him and bring him unto the elders of the city. Now this puts a limitation on parental authority to punish the child. The elders will make the final determination in this serious case. They take him onto the gate of his place. The city gate was the place where trials were held. Verse 20. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn, rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. So this is violating Deuteronomy 5.16, the fifth commandment. So the role of the men in the city, verse 21, and all the men of the city will stone him to death with stones. Now normally the accusers cast the first stones, but due to the sensitivity of parental feelings, they're exempt from partaking part in this particular execution. But the results, why do they do this? So you shall put away the evil from the midst of you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. All right, chapter 21, verse 22, we move to another specific law, the law of a criminal's corpse. Verse 22. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and you hang him on a tree. Now, remember, hanging on a tree was not the means of death. The body was hung on the tree after the death as a warning to the community. The rule in verse 23 his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. And the principle, for he that is hanged is cursed of God. And this is referred to in Galatians 3.13 as well. Verse 23, the reason, 
that you defile not the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance. So removing the corpse and burying it prevents defilement of the land. Now we come to chapter 22, verse 1, and we're dealing with the law of lost property. The law of return in verse 1. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide yourself from them. So we are to have an active desire to return lost property rather than to keep it. You shall surely bring them again unto your brother. Verse 2. What about the case of a long distance or an unknown owner? So two possible situations. If your brother is not near unto you, that's a far distance, or if you know him not, that you're not his acquaintance, the proper action is then you shall bring it home to your house, and it shall be with you until your brother seek after it, and you shall re restore it unto him. Verse 3. So you shall do with his ass, so you shall do with his garment, so shall you do with every lost thing that is your brother's, which he lost, which you have found. You may not hide it yourself. There's no, there's to be no finders, keepers, losers, weepers attitude in Israel. Verse 4, the case of an endangered animal. You shall not see your brother's ass or his ox fallen down by the way and hide yourself from them. You shall surely help him to lift it up again. So rescue the animal. It's a very valuable possession to your kinsmen. Now in verse 5, we come to the law of clothing of the opposite sex. You see, God wants to maintain proper gender boundaries and proper gender identification. So in verse 5, a woman shall not wear that which pertains unto a man. Now the Hebrew does not mention clothes here, it just says male things, things that pertain to a man, clothes, ornaments, weapons, whatever. And neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. And here a woman's garment is explicitly stated, so the sin of the male is more focused. The reason for whoever does these things is an abomination unto the Lord your God. So the emphasis is on the distinction of the, of the sexes based on clothing they wear. They wear. This is a law against <laughs> transvestitism. That's cross-dressing, seeking sexual pleasure by wearing the clothes associated with the opposite sex. This is an abomination in the same category as homosexuality. This is not a law concerning fashion. It's a law dealing with deviant sexual behavior. And remember, abominable means repugnant, hateful, loathsome. God is highly disgusted by these practices. And our current LGBT culture needs to take this principle seriously. Now we get to chapter 22, verses 6 and 7. And we come to the law of the mother bird and her chicks, verse 6. If a bird's nest chance to be before you in the way, in any tree or on the ground, with the young ones or eggs, and the dom, the mother sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, you shall not take the dom with the young. Verse 7, you shall surely let the dom go, the mother go. But the young you may take unto yourself. Why? That it may be well with you, that you may prolong your days. Now this is possibly a principle dealing with the reverence for the parent-child relationship. Uh, you might think that this is, be, this is true even among animals. Leviticus 22:27 might indicate that. But most likely, the principle is conserving the food supply for the future. Avoid exchanging long-term profit for short-term gain. Let the mother go. She can lay more eggs in the future. In verse 8, we come to the law of the parapet. When you build a new house, then you shall make a battlement around your roof. Now, roofs were flat in those days, and the battlement was a low wall around the edge of the roof. That you not bring blood upon your house, if any man fall from thence. So roofs were used like patios, and the danger was someone falling from your roof. For example, here's a 
diagram of an ancient Israelite house. And here you can see that they've drawn a little bit of a parapet around the edge. And the same thing is true with this model. You can see the battlement around the edge of the roof to keep somebody from tumbling off. Now we come to verse 9 and the law of forbidden mixture, starting with seeds. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed. The reason? Lest the whole fruit be forfeited. Uh, forfeited means not permitted for human consumption. This is the penalty for disobedience. The seed which you have sown and the increase of your vineyard. It applies to animals. Verse 10. You shall not plow with an ox and ass together. Verse 11, it deals with threads and cloth. You shall not wear a mingled stuff, wool and linen together. So this is to keep Israel distinct in daily practices. In verse 12, we come to the law of the tassels. You shall, you shall make you fringes upon the four borders of your vesture, wherewith you cover yourself. Now, no, no, no uh, purpose is stated here, but in Numbers 15, the purpose for these, these uh, tassels is a memory aid. Then in verse 13, we come to the laws of personal and family purity. Uh, first, we deal with the accusation of non-virginity. Verse 13, if any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, verse 14, and lay shameful things to her charge and bring it up an evil name upon her, his claim, and they say, I took this woman, and when I came nigh to her, I found not in her the tokens of virginity. So this is an accusation of premarital sex. He wants a basis for getting out of the matter, no matter what it costs the girl. Now the response of the parents is verse 15. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the token of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. Verse 16, and the damsel's father shall say to the elder, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hates her. Verse 17, and lo, he has laid shameful things to her charge, saying, I found not in your daughter the tokens of virginity, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And, he shall, and they shall spread the garment before the elders of the city. Now there's two, arm, two options regarding the garment. It might be a stained cloth that's already in the possession of the parents, and the blood would have been the blood of the last menstruation before marriage. Or it could be the stained garment from the wedding night, which, have been, which would be taken by the parents immediately as an evidence of virginity. Number two seems the most probable here. But in verse 18, we come to the punishment of the accuser, the role of the elders here. And the elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him. This included being flogged and fined. Verse 19, they shall fine him 100 shekels of silver, that's double the bride price, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he has brought an evil name upon a virgin in Israel. And she shall be his wife he may not put her away all his days. So there's no option for divorce if you try something like that. Now, in the case of premarital immorality, verse 20, but if this thing be true, that the tokens of her virginity were not found in the damsel, verse 21, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of the father's house, because shame rests on the entire family, she committed fornication while she was still under her father's authority. And the men of the city shall stone her to death with stones. And verse 21 continues, because she has wrought folly in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So you shall put away the evil from the midst of you. Now in verse 22, we move to the case of adultery, violating the seventh commandment. If a man be found lying with a woman, married to a husband, the punishment, then they shall both of them die, the man that lay with the woman and the woman, and so you shall put away the evil from, from Israel. 
And in verse 23, we come to the case of a betrothed virgin and consensual sex. If there be a damsel that is virgin, betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, verse 24, then you shall bring, both the, both, bring them both out under the gate of the city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. Verse 24 continues, the damsel, because she cried, she cried not, she cried not being in the city. If she's in the city, if she cried for help, if she screamed for help, she'd be heard and someone would come to help her. So the assumption here is consensual sex. And the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife. So you shall put away the evil from the midst of you. In verse 25, we come to the case of the rape of a betrothed virgin. But if a man find the damsel that is betrothed in the field, that's out in the country, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lie with her shall die. Verse 26, but unto the damsel you shall do nothing. Why? There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For when a man rises against his neighbor and slays him, even so in this manner. Verse 27, For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried. She's given the benefit of the doubt. She cried out for help. But because she's out in the field and is deserted, there was none to save her. Now, in the case of rape or seduction of an unbetrothed virgin, uh, ver uh, verse 28, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, that is not betrothed, and lay hold of her, the Hebrew allows for seduction here, which seems more likely, he seduces her, and they lie with her, and they be found, the punishment is verse 29, first the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, that's the bride price, and she shall be his wife, because he had humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So divorce is not an option in that case. Now in verse 30, we come to the case of incest. A man shall not take his father's wife. This is the case of marrying the stepmother after the death of the father. This, this is considered a supreme form of wrong in scripture. And shall, and shall not uncover his father's skirt. This means uncover one's nakedness. This is a dishonorable action, especially of a sexual nature. So this action violated the sanctity of the father's marriage. Now, no punishment is mentioned here in Deuteronomy. However, in Leviticus 20.11, the punishment is the death penalty. And now our subject changes in verse 23, verse 1 to the law of entry into the assembly of the Lord. Verse 1, considering, uh, focusing on the unit. He that is wounded in the stones, that's his genitals, or has his privy members cut off, that's castration, shall not enter into the assembly of the Lord. The assembly of the Lord is the formal gathering of God's people at festive occasions. These are gatherings for religious purposes. It consists of exclusion from the public corporate worship in the temple compound or the tabernacle compound. This is not speaking of exclusion from the nation. Certain handicaps excluded men from participation, but not from membership in the covenant nation. And the principle here is separation from paganism, where deformities like this were accepted and even became central in the worship. Now, this law is not applicable under the law of the Messiah in the New Testament. For, for example, Acts 8, 27 through 40, dealing with the youth Ethiopian eunuch. And it will not be applicable under kingdom law. In Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 5, we see the eunuch will be welcomed in the temple. In verse 2, we turn to the subject of an Ill illegitimate child. A bastard shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even unto the tenth generation shall none of, his, none of his enter the assembly of the Lord. This is the corporate worship. 
Now the sons of Lot come to the fore in verse 3. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation, shall none belonging to them enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Now, uh, again, that term forever is a little strong. Here the term does not mean eternity. In context here, it means to the tenth generation. And the reasons why, in verse 4, because they met you not with bread and water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt. And secondly, because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor in Mesopotamia, to curse you. That's in Numbers 22 through 24. Verse 5. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not hearken into Balaam, and he reversed the curse, but, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing unto you, because the Lord your God loved you. Verse 6. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. And that means they're to the end of their lives. Now being masculine in gender, this prohibition only applies to Ammonite or Moabite males. And the Bible national identity is based on the father, not on the mother. And that's why this, this curse does not apply to King David. Ruth was a Moabitess. She was the great-grandmother of David, but that's only three generations back. So it didn't affect him because it affects the men only. Now, dealing with the uh, Edomites and the Egyptians in verse 7, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. See, they are descendants of Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. This is the nation most closely related to Israel by bloodline. And then the Egyptian, you shall not abhor an Egyptian because you were a sojourner in his land. Verse 8, the children of the third generation that are born unto them shall enter the assembly of the Lord. And finally, uh, well, we, we're coming to a close here. We come with the law of the sanctity of the military camp. Now, personal hygiene is in focus here. Verse 9, when you go forth in the camp against your enemies, then you shall keep from you every evil thing. So the case of ritual uncleanness, verse 10. If there, is any, if there is among you any man that is not clean by reason of that which chances him by night, such as a nocturnal omission, this is not morally wrong, it just renders him ceremonially unclean, then he shall go abroad out of the camp and shall not come within the camp, verse 11. But it shall be, when the evening comes on, that he shall bathe himself in water, and when the sun is down, he shall come within the camp. And now as we get to verse 12, we come to the call of nature. You shall have a place also without the camp, whither you shall go forth abroad, verse 13. And you shall have a paddle among your weapons. You'll have a shovel or a spade. And with it you shall, when you sit down abroad, this is to defecate, you shall dig therefore and cover that which comes forth from you. And the basis is the sanctity of the camp. Verse 14. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you, to give up your enemies before you. Therefore <laughs> shall your camp be holy that he might not see an unclean thing in you and turn away from you. Now this might seem like a whole bunch of a lot of incidental details in life, but the purpose for all this is to keep Israel as a distinct nation, different from the nations all around them. All right, well I've come to the end of my time and I've also come to the end of my schedule. So we will pick up the next lesson at verse 15 with the law of the escaped slave as we move through these specific uh, stipulations of the, uh, of the um, covenant, the um, suzerain vassal treaty called Deuteronomy. All right, so any announcements of any sort? Anything like that? Okay, well, you're dismissed. Have a good night's sleep.